So let's uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll dive in here. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather together to study your word. I thank you for each of these that have come out um, to take this time tonight to look into the things that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive the things in your word that we will see tonight. And I pray that you would open your word that we might peer deeply into it and discover the rich truths life-changing truths that you've placed there for us. Be with us tonight and be honored and glorified in and through our discussion and we'll thank you and praise you as you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, I haven't done this in a while, so it occurred to me today that being on video that I need to make sure from a, um, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for, where you steal somebody else's material. Copyright. Copyright infringement, yeah. Uh, I, plagiarism, plagiarism, yeah. Um, much of this material uh, comes from a study guide provided by Life Changers, uh, and it, it's a great study guide. I commend it to you uh, for the study in the Book of Romans. Much of the, but some of the material, in fact, much of the material we're going to begin to consider over the next, you know, I put together the notes. thinks it's gonna think it's gonna be a, a night's worth of notes, and six weeks later we're finishing them up. So, but it's been good. It's been rich discussion. But much of the material we're going to be looking at is going to be coming from study notes that uh, the Lord began to develop in me back in the early two thousands, and it's actually in book form book form now uh, on on Amazon. So um, that's. The source of much of this information I just felt like I needed to make sure that we made that clear so if somebody gets it they don't say oh well, he's rough on someone well, okay anyhow so tonight we're going to start talking about the section uh, from chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 and the, the study guide entitles this put to death so uh, Ron I see you've got your Bible open would you read um, Romans chapter 8 verses uh, 12 and 13, please. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to, to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. Okay, thank you. So... And I, I, if you've got the new notes that have the correct number in it, this is question 17. Um, what obligation does Paul imply that we do have? We, we already talked about what we're not obligated to, and that's the flesh. But what obligation does Paul imply that we do have here in verse 12? Elaine? Led by the Spirit of God. Okay. Okay. To be led by the Spirit. To live according to the Spirit. That's that's what he um, he says there. Um, he, he says, and he he refers to it as an obligation, or he doesn't refer to it, but he implies that it's an obligation. So. Uh, while it is an obligation, as the author of the study guide puts it, I submit to you it's also an opportunity that we are privileged to enjoy. It's an opportunity that we are privileged to participate in and really enjoy. Um, is it easy? No. Is it worth it? You better believe it. Absolutely. Um, according to the Spirit refers to relying on the help of the Holy Spirit. The helper, as defined, as stated in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus said, it's to your benefit that I go away, for if I go away, the helper will come. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, very familiar passage to most uh, people in the church, particularly 
in the in the Pentecostal church is because this is actually the 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 byline that was on the the cover of the Pentecostal Evangel, the the Assemblies of God publication for years and years and years. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that was declared to Zerubbabel uh, back in the Old Testament by the prophet of God. But really, it it certainly rolls forward and applies even more so now in the New Testament uh, as we uh, endeavor to be led by the Spirit of God. Uh, can We cannot accomplish this through our intellect by way of mere education alone. It's just not possible. You can't learn. You know, it's not about there, there are, in the secular world, in the, in the uh, humanistic world, humanistic worldviews, education is everything. If you get enough education, you can defeat poverty. You can defeat this, you can defeat... It's simply not true. Why isn't that true? Why isn't education alone enough? I'm not sure the distinction you're making. Because we can't accomplish this through our intellect. We, by, we, mer by mere, you're talking about just, um, it's not by might, not by power, but by spirit. Like, is that what you're referring to? Or just well, yeah. I mean, living according to the spirit. Why, why isn't education enough? Because, well, you're educated. That doesn't mean that you're living it out. Right. You know, the, the um, Spirit leads you and talks to you and guides you. You might know all of that, but unless you submit to it, you, you can't. Okay. Ron? You're still living to, by the flesh. Exactly. We're, 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 yeah. It, the intellect is part of our human nature, isn't it? It's part... And isn't that affected by our fallen nature? Kathy, what were you going to say? Well, no, I was just going back to that. I was saying that, you know, you can get a book on how to drive a car. You can read the manuals. You can do everything. And so you can be educated. You can know exactly how to drive a car. But until you get behind that wheel, it's of no use. So there has to be like a practical side of education. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and what would prevent us from being able to even do that? That is the fallen nature, you know, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Paul, that's what got us to this point in this text. He laid out the groundwork exposing who we are as human beings. And, you know, we, we've made the observation that there are a lot of good people by earthly standards, but the reality of it is, apart from Christ, it's still sin that motivates us. It's still sin that is behind the things that we do. It's the sin nature. And it's not sins, it's sin. It's the, the ingrained nature of the fallen nature of man. So, yeah, no. Uh, sheer willpower can't accomplish this. You, you don't have enough willpower to live according to to the will of God. It's not possible. If it were, Jesus didn't need to come. Oh, right, yeah. You know, he that's what Paul talked about. He came and he died for our sin so that we can be set free from bondage to sin. Exercising our God-given talents and abilities to the best of our ability can't accomplish this. And again, it's the same template that um, only by dependence upon the Spirit of God can we successfully stand against the desires of our own flesh. Because our own flesh will continue to assert itself um, and exert itself um, no matter what we try to do in and of our own strength. Um, so, Jamie, would you read Chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Elaine, read verses 9 through 11. And Shirley, read verse 13, please. 
there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. And verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So why do we have this obligation? And I think it's I think it's still right to see this as an obligation. Why can we say that this is an obligation based on verses 1 through 11 and verse 13? Jamie Okay. Okay. And I wrote the same thing. I think because the Spirit of God in us, and He gives life, whereas walking in the flesh produces death. Okay. Ron? Well, He talks about in verse four um, the requirement of the law might be fulfilled. Those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So it's kind of like we have a. We're, we're obliged to follow the rules. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, know, I, I think you're on the right track. Um, so why is this an obligation? Any other thoughts? Surely. It's, it's tough for me to... Okay, Kathy, you had your hand up. Yeah, when I was just looking at like the, um, the Greek word, it means um, that obligation, like indebted or owed. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah, after all that he's done, it, it's not just a mere obligation. It, it you know. It really is debt. an obligation. Yeah. We're yeah. in debt. Yeah. Know, um, for, for what he did. So. Yeah. Dale. The, it says that we are, okay, we are under obligation not to the flesh because Jesus has freed us from that obligation because he paid the price. Okay. And so now, we, being that we're free from that obligation, we, by, by faith, accept his uh, sacrifice, you know, for... And 
by our own will become obligated. You know. Will oh. is it an exchange of obligation? Is that, is, see, that's the thing is this, the scripture says we are not obligated. To the flesh. the flesh. But 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 what we're saying is by implication, he's saying you are obligated to the spirit. Right. To live according to the spirit. But it's of our own free will at this point. By yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's now we're in concert with the, the, the spirit that lives lives within us. And he bears witness with our spirit. Well that that's true. But I, I think there is a strong case to be made for now that we know that, now that we yeah. we are now obligated on the other side. Yeah. Run. It's like Jesus did his part, and so now we have to do ours. I beseech you there for a Yeah, 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 yeah. You know I mean? yeah, like, yeah. Like Jesus, okay, Jesus went and did what he, what he was supposed to yeah. do, and now all we have to do is this. And as long as we do that, we're good. Yeah, you know? yeah. So he did his part, so now we have a... We are obligated. Right. Yeah. To do our yeah. Part. yeah. Yeah. It's it's and it you know look you know, at by it. By the way, we have free will. We have free will not to do it. But if you want all the good stuff that goes along with it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want the bad stuff, it it's it's kind of like the Old Testament. Uh, you know the Old Testament um, covenants. You know God made a covenant with Israel, and He said, "I will do this for you." Right. If you do this, yeah. there are blessings. Right. If you do this, there are curses. It's the same kind of a dynamic. Right. The same kind. Yeah, choose you this day who you will serve. Yeah. But why is the obligation even greater here than it would have been in the Old Testament? Kathy. Well, just because of what Jesus did. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he paid the price. Right? We okay. 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 It's life and death. So, because he gave his life for us, and the Holy Spirit has come to equip us. And that's the other piece of it. Yeah. Because Not just because Jesus paid the price for us. In the Old Testament, they believed that Messiah was coming. They believed what was revealed in the book of Genesis, that God was going to send one who would crush the serpent's head. They believed that. But now, even beyond what Jesus has done in sacrificing himself for us, he has sent the Spirit to come and dwell within us. So it's not an external obedience. It's an internal submission. He lives there. He dwells there now. And he's empowering us from within to do that which he's requiring of us to do. Does that track for you? Does that make sense? Deneen, you're awful quiet back there. You ain't nodding on me, are you? <laughs> if I was back there, I might be. I'm just telling you the truth. But anybody else? Consider everything Paul presented to this point in the book of Romans that brought him to make this assertion. And it was interesting to me as I read through this, this time around, I've said to you before that I've studied this section of Scripture for 20 years, and God since God first showed me that whole concept of being led by the Spirit, and never have I got back to drill into it again, and God showed didn't show me something fresh. But look at the context of it. When when we read we read that so often I've heard people say, Well, there's therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, that's true. And they, they almost use it as as a something to try to reject what you have to say about them because you're condemning them. And, you know, it comes... But what Paul is saying is Jesus set us free from bondage to sin. So there is no condemn because we have been set free from the bondage to sin. We have been given, uh, freed from the curse of the law. Yeah. yeah. And we have freedom, that freedom from the obligation to follow our sinful nature, so now we are obligated to follow the Spirit's leading in our lives. So you see how it is an obligation. I got to tell you, when I first read that, 
from the textbook. I went, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. But the more I worked through it and the more I saw the point they were making and the Lord helped me to see this perspective on it, there really is an obligation for believers to be led by the Spirit of God. There really is. All of these things should motivate us to pursue a mindset on the spirit and not on the flesh. They should motivate us to do so. You know, it, it's like when Joyce cooks Dale that special, wonderful dinner that he loves so much. And we all know Joyce is a, is a good cook. You know, and she cooked that special meal just for Dale. Then, yeah, he... he beef Wellington. Beef Wellington, yeah. You know, then Dale is... He, 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 Joyce would never obligate him to do something, but because of what she had done for him, Dale, if she asked for something simple, he's going to jump to it, baby. That's it. Why? Because of what she had done. You know, it, it, it's, and I know that's a, that's kind of a poor illustration, but it brings it right down to earth where we live. When we recognize what someone has done for us, and I think that's, that's the disconnect oftentimes in the church today, is I don't think we really in the church today oftentimes grasp what Jesus has really done for us. Uh, Pastor Mike used to refer to it as easy believism. You know, it's this, you pray this cute little prayer and you're saved. Now go on with your happy little life. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's not about getting your card punched and you get into heaven. It's not about that. We are obligated to live according to the Spirit. And now that you know it, You're accountable for it. And I'm not apologizing because we benefit from it. i got to tell you, in the last 20 years, as, as, as the, the, the Lord has shown me fresh levels of this, and, you know, it, we're going to get there. But, I mean, just, it's an amazing life. It really is. Is it, always, is it always happy, happy, joy, joy, fluffy clouds and pretty little birds? No. No, it's not. But God is able to bring us through that. And we are obligated because of all that God has done for us. This also shows why this is the opportunity or the privilege that we have been given now that we belong to him. Dale, you, used the, 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 you made the point that we still have a free will. God will not compel you to do this. He will not force you to do this. He gave you that free will. We have the we have the freedom to choose. But if we really understand what Paul is writing here, we will recognize that we have an obligation to fulfill. An obligation to fulfill. <laughs> kind of out there, but I I often point back to my military training when I was in the, and I was only in the army three years but I was a kid and it was it, it was you know you, it was drilled into you that regardless of what you think of the individual you respect the uniform you respect the position well that's something that has tracked with me down through my life and and working at Pittsburgh Water and Sewer um, if the boss said to do something I do my dead level best to do what I believe they want me to do, whether I fully understand it or not. You know, I'll jump and then see if it's high enough. Well, this past week, uh, my director sent me, forwarded an email to me, and it just said, FYI. Well, in this email was a vendor that had reached out and was talking about liking to get together. Well, I read that as meaning she wanted me to try to coordinate a get together between us and procurement to discuss this project, you know, this this uh, option that this vendor was presenting. And so I went ahead and I moved it forward and I reached out to the vendor and I reached out to, 
And I tried to schedule a meeting and I set it up only to find out she always forwards those things to procurement. She just happened to CC me on it because it had to do with vehicles. She really wasn't looking to meet with the guy. She was just passing it along. I felt obligated to do what I believed my boss needed me to do. Would to God that we would embrace Jesus' right to place demands on our lives. And the verse that, that Dale quoted a minute ago, we're going to get there in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the context within which Paul is making that declaration. That's why he's making these statements in Romans 8, because of all that Jesus did and the fact that the Spirit has come to empower us. And I've started preaching instead of doing the interactive teaching, which is my favorite on Wednesdays. I, I'm passionate about this. I'm, what's that? I'm passionate about it because it's, it's freedom. It really is freedom. It, if, we're, if, we're, if we're endeavoring to be led by the Spirit, and if we are led by the Spirit, there's freedom there. There is no guilt and condemnation. Why? Because we're following after the Spirit of God. Now, let's not get arrogant about it, say we never miss it. That's a huge mistake, but God will help us with that. We'll talk about that too. Anything else? As, as we yield ourselves to the Spirit, uh, you know, over, over time, Jamie made the, the statement, she said it's hard, but as the Spirit comes alongside of us and eases it, He leads us into it, and as we become more familiar with that, and, and like you said, it's over time you see the, the, the benefit, you know, yeah, of, and, of the Christian life. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I, I, I fully understand what you're saying, but that doesn't mean it won't be hard sometimes. Oh, no, exactly. But, but sometimes it's, it's, it's exceedingly have, hard. Uh, yeah, exactly yeah, right. A, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's beyond anything physical that we, you know, and, and that's the thing is, is the, the battle is, you know, when we start battling in, in, the, in the spirit and, and, you know, putting on, you know, the, the armor, we, we understand why, you know, we were encouraged by Paul to put on yeah, the yeah. army because it's like the fiery darts come, yeah. you know, and it's like that is our only, you know, yeah. the, the defense. But but in, in retrospect, you know, the, the Holy Spirit will equip us, uh, exactly. will train us, will. Yeah, yeah. And as we keep our eyes fixed on him, as we set our minds on the things of the spirit, I said on more than one occasion on Sunday morning and about how, you know, sometimes in the mornings I, I've, I've got, I never used to do this, but uh, I, I listen to some of the Christian music that's out and those, those words get in your spirit. And, you know, I find myself whistling, hallelujah, I am not alone. Always faithful, never let me go, you know. And uh, your spirit lives within me. That I'm, so I will walk in your, you know. I'm, and it's not just the music. It's reminding us of what Paul has declared here. So, okay. What does it mean? To put the death, the deeds of the body, as stated in verse 13. What does Paul mean when he says there in verse 13? Kathy, read that for me. Romans 8, 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, the spirit, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What does it mean to put to death the deeds of the body? To surrender them? Choose the surrender them? Is putting to death and surrendering the same thing? Putting to death usually means kill. Yeah, yeah. done over. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That's okay. That's all right, Norma. 
It's the same. It, it's, it's the same general concept, but it goes even further than just surrender. So what does it mean to put to death the deeds of the body? Jamie, I know you've got night notes. I see you reading. Well, I, I have them. You know, we've accepted, if, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior, then we live according to the Spirit, then our sins are forgiven. But when you're living in the Spirit, you're putting to death the fleshly part of you, the, the, the sin nature of yourself. Okay. So what does he mean by putting to death the deeds of the body? You Choice. Don't engage in certain, what? You don't engage in certain fleshly acts. You know, you're not committing adultery. You're not committing fornication. You're not doing things you used to do and thought was okay. Okay. I mean, you, you're be changed to some extent. Okay, Dale? Yeah, let your mind dwell on these things, that the fruit of the Spirit, we should be manifesting, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit throughout all our day, like choosing the, the greater good, let's say. You know, okay. Choosing, the, choosing the, uh, the, the Spirit over what the, 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 our, the, our sin nature, and we might not even recognize it, but what it is is the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. And so when the Holy Spirit reveals it, obey. It, it come, it, it, first, uh, uh, obey, but then it's like as time goes on, we don't th even think twice about it. It's, it's you know, being in, in concert, in step with... And all of that's true, but what does it mean to put to death the deeds of the body? Ron, well, you're going to put your hand up and cut and, um, some. It says... If you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you, by the spirit, you're putting the death seeds of the body of it, and you'll live. So, by fulfilling your obligation, you get the benefit. You get the, the benefits. You get the light. You get the, the, the everlasting life. So, the, when you're you're putting all that. It's kind of like, it's a little bit what, what everybody said. I just don't know if I can put it into words. Because um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, Elaine, I'm looking for in practical terms. What is, Elaine? Well, what I was thinking was to, when you can say we become a new creature in Christ. Yeah. All right. We put off the old thing, right? And behold, all things become new. Okay. Yeah. So when you do that, you're submitting yourself to the new man, which is not a sinful mindset. Okay. So because of that, then you're putting up the, the old man in the back and embracing the new man. And, and, and all of that's true, but you're just saying the same. You, yeah. You're just restating the right. question. Mm -hmm. you in practical know. terms, it refers to exercising self-control uh -huh. over yeah. the passions and desires associated with our body and encouraged by our fallen nature and the devil. Okay. That's the, pr it's exercising self-control. The fruit of, you pointed to the fruit of the spirit again, a minute ago. What is the last of the fruit of the spirit? Self-control. Mm -hmm. It's exercising self-control over those desires that if we're not careful, we'll take control of our lives, exercising that self-control over the passions and desires associated with our body and encouraged by our fallen nature and the devil. Does that mean we should never be passionate? No. No, I'm passionate about this teaching. Husbands, you should be passionate toward your wife. Wives, you should be passionate toward your husband. There's nothing wrong with that. We're talking about those things that are outside. <laughs> what? I have no idea. She's just over there laughing. Yeah, we'll, we'll just let that go. <laughs> I, I will see you. you. You looked at her. I guess. I asked you. Well, don't you like it when he looks at you, Jamie? There's a time and a place. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> you, you, your 
face is about the color of your hair, Jamie. I, <laughs> yeah, but this is what we're talking. That's the practical. Do, do you see where I'm coming from? Yes. That's what I meant by it. You don't engage That's in those activities. Choice. I just didn't use the word self-control. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and. Yeah. That, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You engage in your own behaviors. So right. But but and but it's easy to say that. But when we when we that to me. That phrase, self-control. Yeah. Where does that put the responsibility? Well, the Spirit didn't help me. The Spirit didn't prevent me from doing that. Because He gave you self-control. Self-control. Okay. What assurances do we have as we endeavor to fulfill the obligation and participate in the opportunity that we saw implied in verse 12? In, yeah, in verse 12. What assurances do we have as we endeavor to fulfill the obligations and participate in the opportunity we see implied in verse 12? Okay, that's good. That's good. One of my favorite lines in this entire study is neither the flesh nor the devil can make a believer do anything. Well, I just couldn't help myself. That's a lie from the pit of hell. For the believer in Jesus Christ, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I, I, I've often pointed to the most of us around here, most of us in here are old enough to remember Flip Wilson. Remember Flip Wilson when he dressed up as Geraldine? You know? Well, the devil made me do it, honey. No. For the Christian, the devil can't make you do anything. And your flesh, newsflash, your flesh can't, your fallen nature can't make you do anything. They are powerless. Paul already talked about that. The power of sin has been broken in our lives. The power of the flesh has been broken in our lives. This puts a sharp point on it. If we follow our flesh or participate with the work of the devil, we do so by our own choice. Does it kind of give you a little willy inside? Huh? Because because we, you know, we're accountable for it. Now, there's no guilt or condemnation. Go back to verse one. You know, don't, don't, because let, let me let me help you with something. The enemy of your soul is going to take these truths and he's going to try to sneak up behind you and whisper in your ear and beat you to death with it. <laughs> Go back to verse 1. Refer, refer back to verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We've been set free. If we follow the flesh or the devil, we do so willingly by our own choice. Galatians chapter 2.20 says, I have been crucified. Somebody referred to this earlier. I think it might have been Dale. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. And by the way, we earlier on we talked about what the word flesh meant. And we said that here in Romans, Paul is talking about the fallen nature. When he uses the word flesh here, he's not referring to fallen nature. He's talking about his physical being. Right. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Jesus lived a life led by the Spirit, and so did Paul. And the fact that Jesus did so, and the fact that Paul did so, gives us ample evidence that we can too. We can't do. 
will we do it as perfectly as Jesus did? Uh, but no. <laughs> if I could get close to what Paul did, I'd be doing a dance of joy. But I, I, I fear I have much, much ground to gain yet. Um, so, in John chapter 8, verse 36 says, If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Again, pointing to why this is an obligation. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, and again, somebody pointed to this one. Yeah, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. The old new things have come. Too often in the church today, we're comfortable with continuing to be who we were. But, I, but my ticket's been punched, so it's okay. No, it's not. It's not. We have an obligation to live according to the, to the Spirit. All right, so let's begin to talk about children of God. Uh, who's up to, Elaine, you're up to read uh, Cambridge. Would you read chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, please? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. Okay. To what group of people is Paul's statement in verse 14 addressed? The children of God. Who are the children of God? We are. Hmm? I'm sorry? I said the saved. The saved, yeah, Christians. He's speaking to Christians. Everything that Paul is writing here is directed toward Christians. Uh, in Romans 8 12, he says, so, so then, brethren, which is clearly a reference to believers. Brethren. He's not talking about. His Jewish brethren, he's talking about those who are in Christ. Those are the brethren he's referring to. In the salutation of the letter in chapter 1, verse 7, he identifies his audience as all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Once again, unquestionably a reference to fellow Christians. Why is it important that we see this distinction? And I just went on with my next question without realizing I did that. Why is the answer to this question critical? More than just important, it's critical. Elaine. Well, I think it's because there can't be any Joe Schmo out here because I think you have to give something to get something. You, you give your life to Christ and you get his blessings and grace. Okay. All you right. Have to give. Okay. Why is it important that we recognize that Paul is addressing Christians? Why is that important? Is it, because is it important? Go ahead. Is it because of the distinction is not just to the Jew, but to every man? To all of us, instead of just the Jews? Okay. When he was speaking... He wasn't just speaking to the Jews, he was speaking to the Gentiles as well. Because all of us now are considered the children of God. Because prior to that, only the Jews were considered as children. Okay. People. And specifically those who are in Christ. Right. Yeah. Jane. I think it's because we're held to higher standards now. Because we've accepted Christ, we know Christ, we know what comes with that territory. Okay. And that's different from we're not ignorant anymore okay that's a good way to put it Wouldn't choice it be with um, implying the context then of what he's writing because if he's addressing believers 
then it only applies to them. It doesn't apply to any everybody in the world. Oh. Whereas, um, you know, so if there's an admonition in there, that means that's just for you. It doesn't apply to the people who are still living in the flesh because they only know about the flesh and, and so forth. Exactly. All of these things fit together very nicely, and that's exactly it. It shows to whom Paul's remarks apply. Because we recognize, that, and, and it's important whenever you look at Scripture, that you recognize who is being addressed. There, there's a, a verse in, in Proverbs um, that I've heard kind of ripped out of context. It says, uh, as he believes in his heart, so is he. And I've seen people apply that to Christians. He's not talking to Christians. If you read the context, it talks about a selfish man. It's important that we understand who is being addressed so that we make sure that we apply the script. Remember what Paul says right or to Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly handling the word of truth. And it's important that we understand who he's speaking to for that very reason that Joyce pointed out and that others pointed out too. Since what he said applies to Christian, see, here's the caveat. Since what he said applies to Christians, it applies to all Christians without exception or excuse. Well, I don't have to be led by the Spirit. I'm still a Christian. But if you're a Christian, <coughs> we're obligated. What's that? You should be. A we're obligated, yeah. Spirit. If you are a Christian, then we are obligated to do this. Because he's speaking to all Christians. And he's speaking about all Christians. Joyce. The flame, the devil's advocate here. <laughs> I mean, verse 1, in the beginning, God. So isn't this a whole book from beginning to end all about God and, and to the people of the world, whether believer or unbeliever? You know what I'm saying? So and we're all responsible for everything written in here, whether we've ever opened it up or not, because this is his book that he gave us. We're talking specifically about what Paul is saying here in Romans about being led by the Spirit. That it does not we, we cannot apply this and insist that this applies to non-Christians. Because non-Christians are incapable of being led by the Spirit of God. They are incapable of putting to death the deeds of the flesh. They're bound by the deeds of the flesh. Now do you see the distinction? I, I understand the point that you're making. God's word is to all of mankind. But it begins with the gospel. Yeah. Unless you surrender to the gospel, unless you recognize that Jesus paid for your sin and he died to set you free and, and you become born again and you've been redeemed, then this doesn't apply to you. Now, now do you understand? That's like... You know, it would be like trying to insist that um, now I, 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 my, my illustration just fell apart in my own head. Dale. I'm looking at this whole, whole thing and it's like Paul is of a mindset of a lawyer. Okay, And so you see like in, in chapter 1 he's you know, the, 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 the gospel. So what it is, is I think he, he, he began by uh, laying out an ironclad um, defense, you know, for for the church, you know, in in, in uh, as as the way that, that we, we think and the way that you know uh, to where. But then he comes. We come to, to, to chapter eight, and what does it say here in the beginning? It's the law was weak. In in no matter, it's like what you do. It's like you're not going to to uh, convince. Uh, mankind of right. sinful nature. Right. It's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, so, so it's like we're working in closer <coughs> with Him. Right. And so basically, He's coming down now, and He says, "You know, throw away the law, walk by the Spirit." Yeah, I, I would, I would stop no, too no, short. No, no, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say throw it because yeah, yeah, yeah. The law is good. No, 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 right. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and yeah, I just I understand what, what you were what saying, but. It's, I understand what you were yeah, saying, yeah. but you know, we got to yeah, be yeah, careful yeah. about throw away the law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Captain. Yeah. Well, you know, about that. It's like if you're in a family, there are responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
It fulfills the law. Sorry. Yeah. To, to be responsible for the things that to that standard to that standard yeah but this is the Tracy household right and so I wouldn't expect you know Joe Smith to have to live up or to you know, the Tracy standard the, the, the Tracy standard so it's like until they grasp that then they're not even capable because in the flesh without the Holy Spirit without that regeneration they're not even able no matter how hard we try on our own, we cannot. So this cannot apply. It would be yeah, unfair. And, and <laughs> it, it would be unfair. It is unfair. Yeah. It is unfair. In fact, one of the, and, and uh, I, I really appreciate what you said, because it, it, you, you, you said grasp, but then you, you kind of augmented it or, or kind of clarified it. It's not just, a, because it's not about a mental grasp. It's about regeneration in Christ. Mm -hmm. We are now new creatures. We're not who we were. Christ now dwells in us. We have been given the opportunity and the obligation to do this. Too often, we in the church in America, and I don't think it's just America, but I can speak to the church in America because that's what I'm a part of. It seems to me that too often in the church, there's a failure to make a distinction between Christians and non-Christians. And what that results in is either expecting to the world to live like Christians, and when they don't behave like Christians and they behave like sinners, we just, I can't believe they would do that. And we get indignant about it. They can't help themselves. I said, I went to one Steelers game in person, in my entire life, and if I never go again, it'll be too soon. Because I was surrounded by a bunch of people that were drunk and out of control. Now, on one hand, it just aggravated me because I don't like being around drunk people that are out of control. I used to be that way. It's been a long, 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 long time ago, but I don't like being around it. But the other side of it was, it kind of grieved me because they don't have an, that's, they're looking for that fulfillment that can only come from the cross of Christ. And so they're, what are they, they're living according to the flesh. They don't, it's wrong for us to expect. It's like when, if we get a dancer from down the street that starts coming to church here on Sunday morning, you know, I would appreciate it if the ladies didn't drag her in the back room and throw a, you know, throw a rug around her and tell her to be more, you know. She don't know no better. If she got a skirt up to here and a neckline down to here and, you know, all of her body showing, she don't know no better. She can't, that's what she knows. Once she gets redeemed, let God clean it up. Let God take care of it. And too often we in the church, we, you know, we expect people to come in and be all shiny and Christian-like, you know? And when we fail to make that distinction between Christians and non-Christians, we then, as the church, earn the miserable reputation we've been labeled with as being judgmental and condemning. And that's, that's, we ought not to do that. Because, Denise. Sure, we have a choice, as the but but ultimately our flesh is driving the bus apart from Christ. It's not an excuse. Hmm? Saying that they have an excuse. No. Because we all have that that inner conscience that tells us right from wrong. Yeah. Exactly, and and that goes back to an earlier point in the Book of Romans where he said they're without excuse. Because God's nature and his character have been revealed through creation. Now let me come to the other side of this. While we've got to be careful in the church that we don't expect non-Christians to live like Christians because that's, 
this doesn't apply to them. On the other side of it, we in the church can't justify living like the world because that's the other side of it. There is an obligation to us. We are obligated to live according to the Spirit, to learn to be led by Him, to walk with Him and fellowship with Him. So it's important that we make this distinction. Does that make sense to you? Is that Kathy? Well, I was just thinking about what the meeting had just said. And so that while we have a conscience that we do have the ability to make right choices um, to live a, we need that spirit in order to live it all the time. Does that make, does that make yeah, it better? To not fall prey to it, yeah. You know, because yeah. otherwise then, you know, they could say, well, I, I can't help it. I can't help it, yeah. You know, it's just, I think yeah. it goes back to what Romans says. In Romans, when Paul says, I, what I will to do, I will not do. And exactly. I, what I will not to do, that's the thing I practice. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free right. from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. We, we, we can't, apart from Christ, we, the only choice we have is to live according to our flesh. To how we feel, what we think, what makes me. And it really, it comes back to me, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Me, 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 it's all about me. Then we wonder why our society is so screwed up. Because they don't know Jesus. They don't know that there's freedom from that. Does all that work for you? Does that make sense to you? Okay, well, we will pick up at question 23 next week. And hopefully we'll do more interaction and less preaching. But, uh, 